Hello and uh, welcome from the Department of Implied Linguistics. My name is Esther Asprey and I'm a Senior Teaching Fellow in the Department and I'm here to talk to you about modern languages and linguistics and modern languages with linguistics. So our department have the benefit of being um, very small. We have a, a high staff ratio to students and we teach in small seminar groups. We bring our own research into the classroom, which means that you will work with data that staff collect, uh, so real language data, and there are plenty of opportunities for support outside the classroom, which I'll speak to a little bit later on. You can see here the module framework for modern language and linguistics on the left, modern language with linguistics on the right. And you can see that the core module they share in common in year one is linguistics understanding language, which is an overview of phonetics, phonology, morphology, syntax, so the rank scale of language, the structure of language. We then go beyond that to look at semantics, the meaning of words, and how that can shift across time, and pragmatics, language and use, so how people from different cultures might communicate, how people from different social classes might communicate differently, how it might affect communication if one is an L2 speaker, so a second language speaker of a language. In the second year, you go on to take the core module lingu linguistics, structure, sound and meaning, which is an even deeper look at the theory surrounding language. Is language something that we're born with the ability to learn extremely quickly as people like Noam Chomsky would argue or do we look to the input for our inspiration so do children actually learn chunks of words do they learn verbs like pouring down because they hear structures like it's pouring down with rain uh, but they might not learn pour until later because they don't hear the verb pour in isolation it tends to pat pattern with a preposition so that would be the approach of people like Michael Tomasello uh, and you'll see that there's then a wealth of modules you can choose from. Fairly obviously, if you're doing modern language and linguistics, there are more, but there are still an awful lot of modules to choose from if you do the pathway with linguistics, um, to the extent that in your final year you can choose two modules. Um, and for those of you doing modern language and linguistics, you would choose uh, 15 cats, one module. And there's a, a big wealth of uh, modules. I'm going to talk about just one of them, which I co-convene, which is multilingualism and culture because I think it's perhaps the most applicable today. Um, so we look at what bilingualism is, uh, and we look at lay notions of bilingualism, so perhaps the idea that we speak two languages with equal fluency, we problematise those. We talk about real bilingual, real multilingual communities around the globe and how they actually use their languages. We look at the issues of who speaks what to whom, so what might me, what might me choose one language over another, what might make me change the language that I'm speaking, mid-utterance, are there rules to say how I can change the language or when I change? What might make speakers shift away from the language that they normally speak to start adopting another language and might this cause death of a language in the end? We then go in the second half of that module into psycholinguistics, so how speakers for example learn to differentiate in early infancy between different codes, how do they pull apart the two or more languages that they speak, where do they store them in the brain? How do they access them when they speak? And really, how do we know this? What kinds of experiments can we set up? And what do we know about the structure of the brain and the activation mechanisms in order to know this? And just to show you a little tiny example of this, I'm going to talk a little bit about linguistic portraits and linguistic repertoires. So the notion that we can draw a picture of ourselves, and we can actually map our language and dialect use and even our register use. So if we knit, for example, we can understand knitting patterns and knitting language. If we do woodwork, we can understand about different bits and different woodworking drills. We could map all of this language use onto our body. And this sketch comes from a person who is uh, French by nationality now, but he took a long time to settle on the passport that he wanted to apply for. And his parents were, um, on the one hand, a German soldier in World War II, and on the other hand, a French citizen. His mother was a French citizen. And he feels very torn between these two nationalities. He didn't want to choose, but he said in France, they said to me, vous devez choisir, you have to choose. You can't be a German and French. Um, you can't have dual nationality. We won't allow it. And he said, das war mein großer Traum. It was my big dream to be a dual national because I feel part of both. And I don't like my French side as much as I like my German side. And you can see that he's coloured German in bright red. But he's got a blue eye, so even on his German side he feels when he's being German, he's still got a French side to him. When he's in France teaching, because he teaches, he's still got a German side to him. He really likes Italian, which he acquired later in life. He sees it as a sort of freeing language, which doesn't have any of these ideologies attached to it. Because, of course, he comes, he lives now in Alsace, and his, his mother was from Alsace. And Alsace, of course, was occupied by the Germans in World War II and has been the subject of tussles between those nations for many years and has changed hands a good few times. 
He understands Alsatian dialect and he also finds that freeing and his life partner speaks Luxembourgish and he likes these languages, these minority languages, because they straddle the borders. They straddle the borders of Frenchness and Germanness and they resist categorization. He can also speak English, so he's had to learn English for his work, but he finds that rather constraining. He finds it a world language which he says dominates and constrains us all. So he really, really likes Italian because it's free of all the ideologies. But you can see that he's covered his... He's coloured his left leg in in pink, and that's Saarländisch. So that's the regional variety of German that he spoke when he lived in Germany as a child with his parents. And he found that much more freeing than standard German, which as a French speaker, he tended to be judged for by his French relatives. And they would they they would always call his father, you know, uh, Le Bush, uh, so a reference to the war. So he was, a, he was a, an enemy, if you like. He's never felt quite at home in one country or the other, and his portrait reflects that. And he orients towards these kind of minority languages, which he finds much more freeing because they straddle the boundaries. So we look at this kind of evidence, this kind of psycholinguistic, this kind of social evidence in, in the start of the module, and it's really fascinating what we can glean from it. That's just a little glimpse of our teaching then, and just to wrap up, uh, we do have plentiful opportunities for engaging and stretching yourself. So we have an active Lingsoc, the, the Linguistic Society. Um, one of their main aims this semester is to put on a statistics workshop so they're collaborating with the School of Computing um, to do a statistics workshop for linguists to learn to write with the coding program R which is incredibly useful and a really good opportunity. We're members of the Migration and Translation Network uh, which regularly takes on projects and has just taken on a project about language learning online in the pandemic and this is an opportunity to work with published researchers and possibly even to collaborate on journal articles which go out for publication it's a really good chance to stretch yourself get to know other people from other departments apply your linguistic skills and finally we have a multi-div module which takes place over the summer so multilingualism and diversity and this looks at linguistic landscapes so language as it's encoded in the signposts around us the job adverts that we see handwritten in shops the kinds of newspapers we can buy any of you who've been to london will know that you can buy newspapers from all over the world but are there patterns to this are there patterns to the kinds of languages we see in different cities and we collaborate with Monash in Australia so you will collaborate with Australian students and compare and contrast the UK and Australia and the languages that get written and used there in the linguistic landscape and that's another lovely opportunity so I hope you've seen some of the richness of our teaching environment and some of the applied way in which we put theory onto real language practices to see if that theory holds up and thank you very much for listening and uh, enjoy the rest of your day <laughs>